Wow. It is May the 20th, 2021. It's a Friday. That was the week. And we have a third member of our gang here. Last week, um, uh, we talked a little bit about Steve O'Hare, the TechCrunch journalist who's doing some other interesting stuff now. And we said, I said to Steve, if he promises to wear his hat, he can come on the show. And here he is. Mr. Hat himself, Steve O'Hare. <laughs> Steve, welcome to That Was The Week. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. And I do well, have a hat. We're thrilled and yeah. honored. And to kick off, I think Keith is going to ask you a couple of questions. So ready, ready for a Keith question here. Oh, wow. Where did you get that hat, Steve? Uh, I got it from a place called Hats and Caps, I think. They do, they do loads of hats. I went down a rabbit hole many, many years ago buying hats but i love i love film noir and i love blues music so it's like yeah it's that, yeah. that kind of you, well, you we should oh go on go on andrew wow if, if you and i had had the hats too we could have been the blues brothers today the blues brothers well you, you were definitely one of the blues brothers I, i'd be the whatever the opposite of blue is <laughs> <laughs> what, Does that what would that be? yellow so um I should tell you, my wife always makes me wear a hat when we go walking because she thinks I've got such pale skin that I'll burn my face off unless I wear a hat. No, it's good too. When I started wearing it, like, I swear people then paid more attention to the hat and less attention to the wheelchair. So that's, that's kind of how it started. Um, I remember we going to Nokia World once. You remember Nokia? You know, the mobile yeah. phone maker. Like, I went to their big conference and I remember one of their executives came off stage ran straight towards me, he's like, hi, like, who are you? And they were, it was blatantly the hat. Like, yeah. So the so, first time I ever, the first time I ever met you, and I hadn't ever looked you up online, I was doing a talk at some conference in London, like startup something or other. I think we started with Brian, yeah. Yeah. yeah in Westminster Hall. And I'd never met you, so I had no idea whether you were six foot six, you know, a dwarf or something in between. And uh, and um, at fir the first, I can remember thinking, okay, I had to kind of reflect because I had no idea who you were. And the hat definitely was part of it, but the wheelchair definitely played a role as well. That must happen to you a lot. I mean, you guys spent last week about, about five minutes saying how unique I was. And then I, I really like that. And then Andrew backtracked and said, maybe I'm not that unique after all. So I'm, I'm like confused. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can be both unique and not unique simultaneously. I think we all are. Now, now what, what Andrew doesn't know about you, Steve, is you actually got your own studio, haven't you? And you're big into music. Yep, we've got my own project studio. You can't really see it because it's all like behind me. Um, yeah, super into music production. I mean, I'm into, I mean, I've made films, I write, I'm, I'm that kind of, you know, creative person who can't really decide what they're really good at, so yeah. I, I try and do it all. And where are you, Steve, at the moment? What part of the world? I'm in London, in North London. Whereabouts um, in North London? In, in Tottenham. Oh, nice. Well, not so nice at the moment. Um, <laughs> but uh, whereabouts in Tottenham? Uh, I'm right south Tottenham, so quite near to Wood Green. Oh, okay. Um, so the fancy I went, bit. I, I don't know. I don't, know that. I don't think most people would agree. I guess if you go a little bit towards Stroud Green, yeah. kind of Green Lane, you get fancy. Um, but I went to school right next to the famous Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. Yeah. So, I'm a well, uh, uh, fan. So I was... Um, I first went to the, my first match was in 1966, um, Boxing Day 1966, West Bromwich Albion at home, nil-nil. I was at the uh, Champions League final in Madrid, all the other finals, so a big fan. I'm a season ticket holder, although it hasn't been much use this year, and they're so bad now anyway. Do you still go to the games? Do you ever go? I haven't been for years. I, I I had a season ticket when I was a kid. I used to turn yeah. up to the ground so often and ask for wheelchair spaces, yeah. right? Because they were sort of quite, like, quite limited. And the the um, women that worked in reception got so sick of me, they yeah. literally gave me a season pass. <laughs> um, but yeah. that was many years ago. And then my brother used to work for 
one of Tottenham's sponsors, and he got access to the VIP box. Nice. For a season off and on. So I, I definitely did start going then. And who's uh, your Andrew, favorite? Andrew, uh, Andrew, Andrew, can I ask you a favor? When you're not yeah. speaking, can you click your mute on your microphone? Because we're getting an uh, echo back from Steve, and I think it's coming back through your speakers. Okay, so I mute. When you're okay, not I'll speaking. Mute. Go on, talk, Steve. Let's just. I'm going to mute for a mile, so I, uh, you guys talk. For a bit. <laughs> okay, yeah. How's that? That's better, isn't it? Yeah, much better. So, so let me put this on screen. I want you to. Tell everyone a little bit what you're up to. I, I saw this in Sifted, which, by the way, is a very, very good UK publication, I think, in general. And it talks about your move from TechCrunch to a, to a new... Uh, basically, they're implying you're working in a grocery store. So what's really going on? <laughs> yeah, so about four or five weeks ago, I quit my job at TechCrunch where I was covering European startups, and in particularly FinTech. Um, and I joined, so in effect, we quit journalism and I joined a startup in London called Zap or tryzap.com is the address. And it's like, we do, we're basically trying to build the future of convenience retail. So we do like, we deliver within 20 minutes, operate our own stores and we sell kind of stuff that I guess in the US would be in a convenience store. So maybe a little bit akin to GoPuff. But definitely not not like a straight up copy. Um, you know, we're doing things our, our own way. Um, and yeah, and they, I was actually scooping their funding news when I knew the founder for many years, and he said like, "Come and work for us." And I was like, "Okay, so what what would I do?" And we carved out this quite interesting position where I'm, I'm VP of strategy, so it's working with the CEO, reporting directly to the CEO, um, founder, and working on kind of internally a lot of stuff that we're doing so that it sticks to the company's principles and the consumer promise and just, yeah, floating around and also um, helping to tell the story outside the company in terms of like being the person that is actually going to be like interviewed. So I've done a lot of press interviews on record. I don't mean the comms, you know, the PR, I mean actually like talking on behalf of the company. So it's a kind of way of keeping that journalistic, I guess, public profile, but also like, because I've seen a lot and I've seen many companies do lots of good things and bad things, kind of helping to install some of those principles and yeah, and ideas within within the company. And it's so far been so much fun and so multifaceted, and like all the stuff I'm getting involved in the challenges. But I guess that one of the um, catalysts for making this big change of leaving journalism to join a startup, and I have founded a startup of my own. It's not like it's I've actually done this before, but um, this is a bigger scale is that the pandemic and the move to working from home kind of opened up a lot of opportunities for me because I need to primarily work from home, if not completely, so I can manage like my disability in certain ways. And suddenly all these jobs that were kind of impossible have become possible because founders and, and VCs and, and, and other people at companies are more open to someone being almost 100% remote, right? It's like that. The progress yeah. has been overnight. And for me, that was quite profound because I spent a year shielding, like literally not going out at all. And yet in some ways, which has been awful in some ways, right? But in other ways, like the world has kind of leveled, like with the way I work. And uh, that's not going to last forever. And obviously I think hybrid is the future. But it just means that nobody now can say, you can't really do your job if you can't come into the office or commute or, or travel now people are like we don't care how you get it done just get it done right and yeah. i always i always used to joke that you've got all these like founders and vcs claiming to be so progressive <laughs> and so sort of iconic you know iconic class or whatever the word is like and yet on this one issue they were always so nervous about letting go of control right and yep. you know so but at TechCrunch, i was always super autonomous Work from home the entire 11 years. Nobody ever questioned my methods. Just get the scoops, get the story over the line. Don't get sued. Job done, you know. So yeah, that's, well, that, that's what I've changed, yeah. I find that a lot in, um, it, it's to do with the control freakness of the, of the DNA of the company. So if a company is led by somebody who 
assumes that people are badly behaved and wants to see them to prove they're not, then it, you know you get this culture of um, snooping and wanting everybody in the office. But in a true team where everybody's pulling their their weight and doing their job, uh, uh, you don't get that. So I think the pandemic has has helped people who are more um, optimistic about their fellow human beings. Let's say. Yeah, I think I agree. And I also think there's um, no, I think some people are better at it than others. But I've had to do it from a pretty young, like really the start of my career. Like the most I've ever gone into an office is like one or two days a week, right? And that's been less and less over the years. So I think you definitely have to train yourself to be able to collaborate remotely and make use of all the tools we have. But we're spoiled right nowadays. There's so many tools, so many ways of, of collaborating online. So yeah, um, for me, it's been just ironic that I say that like, all these kind of people that claim to be forward thinking, but it took, as I think I said in my article for the Sunday Times, like it took a pandemic to break the glass ceiling for me. But, yeah. you know, it's been great so far. And I'm loving it. Well, I'm, I'm very tempted to ask you a whole bunch of highly intrusive TechCrunch related questions now that you're no longer there, but I'll, I'll resist and... <laughs> And and because time is, we, we're already uh, how many? We're eleven and a half minutes in. So let's uh, Andrew, let's give Andrew this uh, signal, and let's move to uh, the, the the meat, meat of, the, of show. the show. Andrew, well, your editorial this week, Keith, is on finding unicorns. Uh, we talked a little bit about this last week about uh, the skill in selecting, sorting the unicorns, the valuable, the symbolic billion dollar. I don't know whether you're using this term literally or metaphorically. How do we find unicorns? How do we distinguish the remarkable startups from the trash? And um, I know, Keith, you, you've got some, some thoughts on that. You've got a new startup which touches on this. I'd be interested in Steve as well. Steve, clearly you've you you've jumped on board a, a startup that you believe i don't know whether it's a unicorn or not but you must you must have decided it has value and i'm sure you've had other offers in the past how easy is is it how easy is it steve and keith to distinguish between companies that are going to bust or fizzle and companies that are really going to take off and become unicorns um, maybe I'll start. And uh, Andrew, again, if you mute when I, you're not speaking. Yeah, I'll mute now. Um, but feel free to unmute and interrupt anytime you want. So it's an interesting thing. I mean, a unicorn is strictly defined as a private company valued by a private investor at a billion dollars or more. That's what it, it means. And, um, you know, sometimes that happens real fast, like, Clubhouse went from being certainly nowhere near a unicorn to being worth four billion in what's felt like a few weeks. So, uh, so if thing if, if if things work out really well, unicorns happen very very fast. And I'd be interested. Sorry to jump in here. I'm interested, Steve, in your take on Clubhouse. I, I've always suspected. I'm not sure how much proof I've got. The Clubhouse is not a genuine startup. It's the plaything of very powerful and wealthy VCs. Uh, and, it, and it can't be included as a typical startup. But maybe I'm being unfair. What do you think, Steve? So I'm struggling whether Clubhouse is a feature, uh, let alone a product, let alone a company. Right? So I think the innovation with Clubhouse is they, they really lowered like, the barriers to live audio streaming. They definitely did that. That's amazing. Um, it's so easy to just onboard yourself and do a stream. And the serendipity of being able to, allowed to pull in audience members and sort of temporarily put them on quote unquote stage, that is definitely an, in, uh, an innovation in terms of no longer being to one to many, but you can also be many to many, right? So that's like, that's the positives. I just, I mean, I got bored really quickly. I was really into it for about a month. I think user retention looks, doesn't look great. Don't think they've innovated fast enough, actually. Maybe the echo chambers allowed them to have a false, you know, like complacency. I don't know. So I, I'm definitely undecided. Uh, yeah, I don't, that, don't know that, if it's a real deal. 
No, that actually intersects quite well with, the, there's two articles this week about unicorns. One is uh, my wife Jenny's piece from Crunchbase, which discloses that there's been 166 new unicorns since January. The second one is by Christoph Jans, who you'll probably know quite well, at least by reputation uh, uh, from Point Nine Capital, who talks about false positives, as in SaaS companies that get very quickly to maybe even 10 million in, uh, in annual run rate, but then never go any further. Uh, and uh, you can become a unicorn by quickly getting to 10 million in annual run rate. And if you stall at that point, it's a huge mistake that you're a unicorn. So I, I think there's, you know, crunch, uh, uh, Clubhouse could easily be one of those. Um, very, and it doesn't even have 10 million in annual run rate. It doesn't have any revenue at all. So it could easily be one of those. So Andrew's question, which is how do you identify one? Uh, my, my method is, um, and I actually can share a screen here by unsharing my other screen. Let me just do that. Um, uh, my method really is all about um, data analytics. And, we, and it means you can't uh, make a determination very quickly. What this is that you're looking at here, when I put it on screen, this is the signal rank capital uh, GP rank algorithm at work. And this is looking at unicorns since 2016. And it looks at which investors have you know, found the most. And it scores them. So here you've got Y Combinator, top of the list, with three, a score of 3,700. Why? They get 60 points every time they invest in a seed round of a company that in the future becomes a unicorn. Axel are, are second. Now, if you break it down, which is what we do at Signal Rank, I can show you the angels that have done well. So Elad Gill, Mark Benioff, Mark Cuban, Alexis Ohanian, Ben Ling, Scott Bannister. These are all names I know. Scott Belsky. These are the people, uh, uh, Naval Ravikant, you know, Jeff Wiener for uh, LinkedIn. These guys have invested early in, in the seed stage of unicorns. Micro, v, micro VCs, you know, the leaderboard is... Uh, Silicon Valley Angel is at the top. So um, what, what I, I, I think the, the answer to the question, how do you find a unicorn is, you follow the people that have a consistent track record of finding them and you see who they're investing in. And then the second thing you've got to do is look at every company they invest in and distinguish between the ones that are on track and the ones that are not. So if you take Zap, your company, who invested in it is actually quite important. And how it's doing compared to the rest of their portfolio is the second thing that's important. And if you track those things and measure them, you'll find unicorns. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, yeah. Um, I've always thought that whether you're talking about angels or C, or C firms or micro VCs, that there's a part of VC that most people don't really get, which is that it's in some ways it's really simple. Right? If you presume, let's take Europe, right? If you presume that Europe is producing better and better companies every year, and that's been a trajectory that's been going on for the last 10 years, then it stands to reason that the pool of good companies has got bigger and bigger. Right? And then it just becomes a case of, you think about like super angels and some of the top um, seed firms, it's like, are you seeing all the best deals? And if you are, um, are you picking the ones that are going to be unicorns in the future and can you get in on those deals and so you see sort of in Europe as the ecosystem matures a lot of those um, those seed firms and, and like they're starting to do more and more kind of content marketing and they're always pairing up with the same pool of angels so I think you're right Keith that you can kind of spot where it's going but where the bit I never could figure out as a journalist is how much of it is a self-fulfilling prophecy because how much is just network effects in terms of right. like, you know, imagine if I started angel investing tomorrow, and I do hope to angel invest next year. Um, like, am I going to see the best deals? Am I and I gonna, am I going to be able to get in on them? And if I am able to get in on them, or even see them, it will be because of my network. Yep. 
right? Well, London, so does that, London, yeah, does London, that make me a good investor? Does that make me a unicorn well, spa or just a good network? A good network is 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 ninety percent of it because both Silicon Valley and London, and that's probably also true in Berlin and Paris and other places. There is a kind of an in crowd who share deals, and you know, so if you can get into the deals that Saul Klein does in London, or that Reshma Sahoni does, or Sitar at Connect, or you know, the guys at Kindred or Hoxton or Episode One, probably you're going to be in some good ones. Um, yeah, or, here, or even or, or even the angels, right? Some of the super yeah. angels, like right? Tavat, oh, Chesterman, Alex, Alex, Alex Chesterman. Chesterman, yeah. Right, we can probably name all you know, you know, and you just describe the networks I'm talking about, you know. So. Yeah. yeah, that that's ninety percent, and then the, I think the other ten percent is not going into all of their companies, but having a bit of a nose for which ones are good and which ones are not. Yeah. So. so now yeah. getting getting in is hard. Getting in is hard. Actually, I'd love your opinion about this. So, I uh, you you know that I was with ADV for the last few years. And we developed this, um, we, we partnered with SeedCamp and we developed this approach of offering SeedCamp when it ran out of money to keep investing in its best companies because it never, it, as a seed fund, it didn't raise enough to do more than a couple of rounds in each company. We said, okay, here's some free cash. You put it into the company in the third and fourth and fifth rounds and we'll share the profit with you. So we supplied capital to their pro rata and one of the companies we did that in was UiPath, which is now at 41x when we invested, which was at the third round. And so my belief is um, partnering with the best seed funds to supply them capital for their pro rata solves the problem of getting into the best deals. Yeah, no, no that's, that's smart, yeah. It's, um, yeah, that's really clever. Um, UI, UiPath is one of those ones. Yeah. That surprised a ton of people. Um, I always tell the story, I'll do it really briefly, but the, the startup that I founded was a startup in Prague and London. And one of the investors, well, the main investor in, in my startup was a firm called Credo Ventures. Yeah. And I lost them all their money, um, but they got in on UiPath. So I'm, I'm very happy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel guilty anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Should never feel guilty because... <laughs> investors assume they're going to lose so many, you know, nine out of 10 at least. So never feel guilty. Um, so Andrew, that, 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 that is, um, that is the, the unicorn story this week, um, which is there's lots of them. They're hard to get into and the world needs a way to do it, especially retail investors who typically don't get in until a company IPOs. And that's what I'm trying to solve for. Um, very early in solving for it, but Signal Rank Capital is basically that. Thank you for mentioning it. Yeah, I have to say, it's not surprising and it's also a bit depressing because it just shows that it's a winner-take-all market controlled by a few people and that uh, in all this stuff about openness and innovation doesn't really exist. And, and I think Clubhouse is an example of that um, in the sense that it's clearly a company that's, fundamentally worthless the garbage that's on it and yet it's had so much visibility in press because it was backed by big money that's uh, yeah the that's one the... thing... sorry andrew go ahead so the one thing that you know you can't have a content company that's completely boring and uncurated and just full of people vcs and tech people and advertising people talking about really boring stuff yep uh, self-fulfilling prophecy is what is this, the word that Steve used, and um, I, I've all, all, you know, I think it's true that you know if Andreessen Horowitz invests in a company, the chances of that company succeeding go way up just because Andreessen invested. If Andreessen invests along with I don't know Sequoia, it, it it would be incredible if that company didn't succeed. So some investors carry so much weight that the entrepreneurs, you know, in a way, buy time to execute simply due to their investor base. And if you've got time, you probably can get it right. And, and so I think that self-fulfilling prophecy, there is some truth in that. That said, ultimately, the buyer 
is the judge of whether you're any good. So if you're an enterprise company, you've got to sell. If you're a SaaS company, you've got to have subscribers. If you're a consumer company, you've got to have users and figure out how to monetize them. That kind of doesn't go away, but it can take much longer to figure out you're a failure if you've got good investors. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're, Andrew, you're muted. Let's talk a little bit about this week. Um, this was the week that crypto crashed. Finally, I've been talking about it for months. Is it a real crash or is it just a, a little minor crash and then everything will come back? Steve? <laughs> well, I, I own a tiny amount of uh, Bitcoin. Or, um, and I was, I, I, I was the idiot that bought, was it 2017? The last, the last massive. And, um, and then it, I lost all my money virtually. I, I, I decided to sit on it and learn about investing properly, you know, like buying the dips or whatever. Um, and I've held mine ever since. So I'm not really that. I'm not really emotionally attached to the to the to the crash or the like. I'm just holding and seeing where it goes, and I think it will bounce back. It seems to always bounce back. What worries me is, like this is why I tell people when they ask me about this, it's it's so ripe for manipulation. That's kind of why I ignore it. Like it, we mm. saw the big crash this week. I'm sure it will go back up. I don't know what caused the crash. I'm very suspicious about the deregulated aspect of it. So. I think it's right for market manipulation. So I, I'm just holding and just, I don't know why I'm holding. I'm just amused by it all. <laughs> so uh, I shared the wrong screen there, Max, and apologies, guys. Um, I, I was going to say, uh, interesting enough, as Bitcoin was crashing, uh, the newsletter makes the point that, and I'll, I'll show it again now. Um, uh, here it is. The dollar fell to a three-year low as the deficit nears two trillion. So you've got to contextualize the, the crypto. Um, I'd call it a correction more than a crash. It's a, it's a $40,000 per Bitcoin as, as we speak now. And it was at 20,000 a few. What does a legendary investor, Stanley Druckenmiller, say about all this, Keith? He's our authority. He, he is um, back again this week with- He uh, looks like a legendary investor too. Look at that face. He attacks the Fed for its policy of printing money, which I've put alongside the story about the dollar falling. And um, up above is Bitcoin uses less energy than the banks use. So uh, as you can see, I'm biased. But I, 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 <laughs> I, do, I, I do think that um, I do think that Druckenmill is right, which is uh, the dollar is worth a lot less than its share of Bitcoin. And they're going to go in opposite directions with Bitcoin going up and the dollar going down in the near future. Steve, do you see the Bitcoin crypto uh, revolution as being a, a, a fundamental re-architecting of the financial world or is it all froth? <laughs> Easy question. Yeah, I mean, I'm more inclined to think it is all froth. I think that article about the energy consumption, I think that's absolute, non like, absolute nonsense. <laughs> you can't compare. You can't say, well, Bitcoin uses less. Was it half as much energy as the rest of the financial system? Yeah. One adds a ton of value, and one it can't make up his mind if it's, you know, a, a, you know, an asset class of whatever it is, storage of value, or a currency, or something else. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, They're incomparable. I, 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 you and Andrew are in the same camp. There, I'm. I'm going to be the sole. <laughs> The sole defender who makes. Okay, the but all right, let me ask you a straight question then. What of any use have you done with Bitcoin this week? Uh, what I've done is I've used it as a bank account. I've, I took my salary and put it in Bitcoin. And so I use it as a bank account. So it plays the same role as my bank account plays, except I prefer it to my bank account. Because if it's in my bank account, it's in dollars, which are going down. And if it's in Bitcoin, it's in Bitcoin, which I think will go up. Okay, so that's a store of value, but presumably you haven't You're spent using it. it. It's yeah. not well, it no, 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 it's more, it's a custodial service as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's got custody of my, val of my money. Uh, it's, it's, it's doing everything a bank does, including paying me interest, which, which is good. Except for this week, right? Maybe well, even, even this week, it would pay interest if I put it into BlockFi. I could get 7 or 8% interest on it. So 
so it is doing everything a bank does. And if you think about if you think about the energy used to produce Bitcoin, that energy costs something. Let's say for every dollar of energy consumed to make Bitcoin, more than a dollar of Bitcoin is mined. So actually the energy just gets transferred into Bitcoin from electricity. Mm. And what about yeah, I read this, yeah, I read this. Yeah, like it's a storage of energy. I mean, I don't, I don't yeah. that. Um and what about the 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 sort of the the connected financial downturn in SPACs and the rest of the financial market. Uh, Steve, uh, are SPACs history too? Are they toast? No, I don't think SPACs are history. I think SPACs are like a perfect storm. Tech stocks, tech stocks are up. SPACs are a great way of going public with even less scrutiny. <laughs> um, I, think I, I think they're here to stay as long as there's an appetite for them, right? From, from but is there still an appetite, Keith, for SPACs? Isn't, aren't there a no. lot of crappy SPACs out there and it's sort of embarrassing now? Uh, well, there's always lots of crap whenever there's money to be made. So, yes, you're right. But there's also lots of good ones. Uh, and, and so I think uh, like App Harvest this week, uh, a vertical farming company, uh, produced its first results since going public through a SPAC and its stock is up quite a bit on the week because of that. So it, it's all depending on the company and its performance, like anything. Um, and so there will be good SPACs. I do actually want to say, just to agree with you, Andrew, and also you, Steve, the one asset class that shines this week is startups. The 166 unicorns are vastly more you know, indicative of growth of wealth than even crypto. So if you were choosing where to put your money, looking forward, I think startups are a good place, except most ordinary people are excluded from investing in them. Yeah, yeah, no, that, yeah, I, get, I get that. But isn't that really because startups are creating, like, actual value? They're creating like, actual value, yeah. And that's what I think when markets don't reflect value is when you have a problem. Yep. Uh, and you, when you say ordinary people, I mean, what does that mean? If you show up to all the TechCrunch events, you can still get in really early here. No, you have to be a, you have to be a qualified investor, which means you must have over two hundred thousand dollars of annual income or over a million dollars of net worth aside from your house. Well, who else is? That? I mean, if you don't have that, then you can't be an investor. You just people who who yeah, live hand right. to mouth are not going to be. They're not thinking of investing in startups. They're not. They don't even know what a unicorn is. No, they're what all about, on, Andrew, 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 Andrew. They're all on Robinhood investing in public companies. Because they're excluded until that stage. Or on Coinbase, right? Whatever. Or on, or on all, Coinbase, all, yeah. They're all investing in these sort of so-called... And they're the ones who will get screwed, market. right? As always. Yeah. And, yeah. and the Andreessen Horowitzes and the Sequoias, are, as you say, betting on themselves. And it's a closed market. So this idea but, of innovation being democratizing is, is one of the great myths. But if you can invest in a vehicle that was able to get in on the best mm -hmm. seed deals by following mm -hmm. those early signals, then that would work. But if you're going to invest in a firm that can't get in on those deals and only gets in the second, third, fourth tier, then you're sort of back to square one. You might as well go back to equity crowdfunding. Well, we're like in the fifth one. tier on this show. We're with um, Keith tier. Uh, I couldn't resist that, Steve. But what about, Keith, the other area that's hot, life, death, and streaming? Is streaming the new crypto? No, it, well, definitely not the new crypto. Stre streaming is, um, it's the new disruption, though. Uh, AT&T this week announced that it's selling Warner Media into a merger with, with the Discovery Channel. And that includes HBO, CNN, and a whole bunch of really valuable assets. And this is only a short while after it previously bought the same assets for 50 billion more than it's getting in value by, by selling them or merging it. So what, 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 what is the story? The story is non-media companies thought that they could add streaming to their uh, pipe business selling bandwidth. Turns out they don't know what they're doing, but streaming itself is just taking over the broadcast world. So streaming is one, but no one yet knows who's won streaming. And, and, and so uh, that, that's how it, it's set. We cover um, uh, a bunch of stuff, including the AT&T merger, 
um, and a, a great O'Malley piece, by the way, called Map, Map, Weapons of Mass Value Destruction, which is all about how when telephone companies buy media, they lose money. So, so that is a, a pretty big trend this week um, and topical. And of course, it's because we're now .TV, we care about this. You're muted again, Andrew. Andrew, you're muted. Sorry. One thing we can say for sure is that anything associated with AT&T or Verizon is by definition a piece <laughs> of shit, right? Oh, no, I don't know about that. TechCrunch is, was part of Verizon. That yeah, but, that has nothing to, but then they saw but that has nothing to do with Verizon. <laughs> it was made before Verizon got its dirty hands on it. I mean, when yeah. I worked there, they, they issued me a laptop, Verizon, so, you know, kind of important. Was it Windows or Mac? No, it was a Mac. It was a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> What's your take on the streaming wars, uh, Steve? Any, um, is it, it's, it seems fairly self-evident that everything now is shifting to over-the-top streaming and that subscription, I mean, c can television, I mean, we've been talking about this for years, but why would anyone subscribe to DirecTV or any of the other platforms? Yeah, I don't, I don't think they will. I mean, I'm surprised how well Disney, Disney Plus is done. That's quite surprising to me. Um, but Chief, didn't you write somewhere or you said somewhere that you think people are going to stop wanting, wanting to pay for like bundled streaming? They want to yeah, yeah, un, 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 unbundle again? Yeah. Do you, re you really think so? Well, I, I think what I'm really saying is people do want to buy bundles, but they want the bundles to have stuff that they actually watch. They don't want to pay for stuff they don't watch in the bundle. Okay, but yeah, how would that well, work? That's nice. Not <laughs> surprising, is it? Let's, uh, <laughs> let's move on. So we've done streaming. We've done Bitcoin. We've done, uh, we've done SPACs. Um, Startup of the week, Keith. Interesting company, I thought, this week. Yeah, well, I'm going with the theme of uh, startups trying to save dinosaurs. And the dinosaur in question here is banks. So a company called Amount, which has the job of helping banks modernize and compete with fintechs, has raised $99 million Series D at a, at a unicorn valuation. So it's my startup of the week because somehow... Uh, it managed to persuade people to give it money, even though its goal is to save the dinosaurs. <laughs> I mean, this this is my area, my special area of interest, where the, where the challenger banks. And um, I don't know about this particular company, but but the mistake that people make when they analyze the space is it's not really about the the better user interface, right, or the better kind of customer experience. The secret to challenger banking is they don't have the legacy cost base, right? It's actually the fact they don't have huge technical debt under the hood and they don't have brick and mortar stores. And like in, in the UK especially, it's quite hard for an incumbent bank to overnight say they're going to shut X number of stores and make people redundant. Like that's not really going to happen. So really the, the advantage to the challenger banks is just a significantly like orders of magnitude lower cost base. And all of the lovely interface stuff, the banks always copy it. Like a couple of years later, they copy all the best features, but they can't lower that cost base. So I think that's that's the bet. That is the bet. You, you, you will remember, I'm, I, listeners might not remember this, but I am British and my first bank accounts were all created when I was in college. And uh, for decades now, I've had a first direct account. And First Direct was the, one of the very first. It's owned by HSBC. It's one of the first banks that didn't have um, a physical banks anywhere. It was a purely virtual organization. And that goes back literally 30 years ago or more. And it still exists. And I'm still a customer. So I wonder whether Amount is doing anything different to what First Direct did then. Mm. And what about the tweet of the week, Keith? Yeah, we yeah we run out of time, so Andrew's moving us along here. Tweet of the week, uh, you love this one. With more than one billion dollars invested in the sector so far in 2021, 
The going public via SPAC continues growing in popularity with agriculture and food tech companies, particularly those involved in indoor and vertical farming, which, as you know, I am. I'm a, I, I have the title SVP and head of corporate development at Infarm. And I added a couple of articles about vertical farming, one from Sifted and one from uh, Crunchbase that covers the vertical farming network. So I thought this was a good tweet of the week because it's something I actually know about. Who's Cami Reffer? I have no idea. <laughs> Should we it's click probably. on it and see? Cami Reffer is, I'm going to tell you now that you've asked, he's at Moss Adams, which actually, funnily enough, is my accounting firm that does my tax returns. See, it's all a network. It's all a network. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Self um, self-propelling self prophecy. Um, so, so, um, Steve knows a bit about vertical farming, right, Steve? Yeah, I think I was probably one of, if not the first, journalist to cover it in farm, I think. Um, and what what's interesting about these some of these plays is they, they put these kind of these modular farming units, kind of internet of things meets farming, since like in consumer facing places. So they put like some of these units in actual um, grocery stores or supermarkets. And that was all very fun and very clever, but I my bet was that this was not going to be the way, and that actually these vertical farmers were going to move into quite big warehouses, sort of still relatively close to den pop population density, but not really. So I does think it, the long term. Go on. Does, does it represent the end of traditional agriculture? Does it mean that in the end everything's going to get produced in um, warehouses? No, because technically something is can't, but a lot of things are. In, in, I, I should just say, I've been involved in InFarm since I met the founders in Tokyo, and I was the judge of a startup competition, and they were the winners back in 2015. And I invested in the company in their seed round. And they're now $300 million plus later having raised. They're um, paying for this event. They're, well, they're, they're we should get up. them as a sponsor. Can't they give me some free vegetables? They can. I like yeah. carrots and broccoli and asparagus. They don't do that yet, do they? They don't no, they, they, they do leafy greens, herbs. You know, uh, they're going to do. They're going to do tomato. Yeah, spinach, lettuce. They're going to do. Um, tom the next two crops are tomatoes and mushrooms. But ulti ulti ultimately, they'll grow a lot. And the, the, their modularity is interesting because they can glue together farms up to millions of square feet. So that so modular doesn't mean small; it just means highly flexible. It, it, you know, the sort of the PR line was always like it's like AWS, right? You can spin up another another module and then you know, um, as big as you want. And they're focused on urbanization. Um, if you look at the urbanization numbers, especially in Asia, cities are sucking the countryside into them. And farming is a massive carbon negative because of transporting food to the cities. So ultimately, for lots of produce, this is a great um, climate change ESG play, as well as a very profitable one. And to, to go full circle, their seed investors were... Local hope and, and cherry, all right. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember when I when I first spoke to, I think the investor at local hope. Uh, my reaction was, this is just bonkers enough that it might work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I um, are they? Can they legitimately be called? A, could you be a seed investor in a in an agricultural startup? Oh yeah, you can. <laughs> you, good, you good, good, good pun, Andrew. What? Good pun. Yeah, well, they've they they're growing something spectacular. It is an interesting space. It it makes sense, actually. On it, that anyway, note, yeah, on that yeah. note, if Andrew's being optimistic, we've got to end the show right now. Yeah, I believe in uh, I believe in um, in agriculture, in 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 reinventing agriculture. We've reinvented finance and banks and streaming, but agriculture is the real thing. That was a great show, Steve. Thank you so much for. Um, spending your time coming on and, and uh, best of luck with everything, especially your new gig. Sounds really interesting. And we'll have you back on again and uh, 
Keith, have a great week and we'll see you next week. That was the week for May 20th, 2021. See you, everyone.